From Sarasota Memorial, this is HealthCast. A healthy dose of information from experts you can trust. The following episode of HealthCast was previously recorded. Sarasota Memorial Hospital's visitor policies have since eased. For the latest information, please visit smh.com slash COVID-19. Hi, everyone. Welcome to HealthCast. I'm Allison Warren. Thank you for joining us as we continue to discuss the important information people need to know amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. In this episode, we're going to be talking about what soon-to-be parents need to know about giving birth during COVID-19 and how doctors are treating mothers with COVID-19. Our guest today is Dr. Kyle Garner, a board-certified physician in obstetrics and gynecology and family medicine. Dr. Garner, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So Dr. Garner, can you start by telling us how OBGYNs are approaching births differently during this pandemic? Well, it's a process that's really undergone a lot of evolution as we learn more about this disease and how it affects populations, how it's broken out into regional differences. In general, we've learned a lot about how COVID affects pregnancy, how it affects women in general when they're moving through this process. And we've tried to adapt our practices to allow for incorporating some of patients' fears and anxieties and making sure that we're not missing things as patients progress through the pregnancy process. We've done some really good things both in our offices as well as in the hospital to help with this. In offices, of course, we are doing things like restricting patient volumes and doing things so that we are continuing to maintain our social distance and isolation. That's really something important so that when patients have to come see a physician, either in their office or in the hospital, they feel like they're not stepping into a, um, uh, an, infection, an infection area where they are increased risk for exposure. So we protect them by screening patients more, we are maintaining our social distance, we are limiting elderly populations who come in and may have the greatest risk for the disease itself. And then in the hospital, we're doing things like, again, also screening and limiting visitors and uh, offering women universal testing when they present to labor and delivery for their, for their delivery day or C-section and helping to identify those patients who may not have known that they have infection. And this helps to protect them and the people around them. There are some people considering holding off on trying to even conceive because of COVID-19. So what do you say to couples who want to get pregnant but do have those concerns? That's a very complicated issue, and that really plays a role into a much broader discussion regarding the financial securities and social support, and all of these things have been tested during COVID. We see people losing uh, their jobs, losing health insurance, and those really probably become the most important discussion uh, for families. As a standpoint for health concerns, you know, does pregnancy or does uh, COVID pose a substantial risk to a woman trying to get pregnant or in early pregnancy? No, we we don't believe that it does. And so I think I tell women, you make those choices based on your ability to bring a child into a supportive and stable and healthy environment, and not necessarily because of these outward health concerns that are brought about, brought about by this virus in our community. So to clarify, pregnant women are not more at risk for COVID-19? That's correct. We don't believe that COVID really affects pregnancy substantially. Now, we know that pregnancy is a risk factor for patients who have COVID in, in the standpoint that if you are pregnant and get COVID, you have a slightly increased risk for needing hospitalization. But the pregnancy itself doesn't put you at risk for COVID. Uh, Pregnancy is a state where women may have an altered immune system, and so certain infections may be more prevalent or they may be more susceptible to them. But we really don't feel that COVID is one of those. And in a nice, also positive note, it doesn't seem to also affect the baby in that the placenta really acts as a interesting barrier in their bodies and prevents a lot of viral transmission across to the babies themselves. Now, you briefly mentioned this before, but how is SMH ensuring that the doctors and nurses assisting in a labor are safe? That's a great question. It's really, again, a multimodal 
a multifaceted approach, and it really starts at the front door. We are really, again, limiting visitation, and we want women to have adequate support, and, but we don't want in giant families bringing or coming to labor and delivery and exposing the population. So we really just ask that they bring their significant other or partner who's coming in and being their one support person through the entire process. We are checking temperatures, and now we have instituted universal screening for all women who are coming into labor and delivery, so that when you present on the day for delivery or your C-section, we are testing every woman, and we have those results back in about two hours, so it's a rapid turnaround test, and that really helps us to determine a patient's risk factors. Then we are able to then extend out our ability of how we treat them or triage them, so to speak, into low-risk patients or high-risk patients. And then the staff is able to use their personal protective equipment, put them in negative pressure rooms, and do the necessary things which help to protect the staff members and prevent us from having outbreaks within the hospital itself. And you mentioned the universal testing, but what are you doing to ensure the safety of mom, that supportive partner, baby during labor as well? Well, we definitely, again, restrict people. We offer masks and, um, and gear to family members and to the patients if they so desire. Um, of course, all of our nursing staff wear masks and personal protective gear throughout the process. So we're also recognizing that we as providers can be vectors to patients and expose them. So we're doing everything that we can to reduce that. Um, in general, the screening is the primary method in which we are wanting to do that because then that helps us to stratify risk for the patients. What do you say to parents who haven't been exposed to COVID-19? They test negative for COVID-19 when they express concerns about giving birth at the hospital. Is it safe? It is safe. Uh, again, I, I, I kind of want to always put this in perspective. Uh, nothing that we do in life is without some small, tiny bit of risk. Every time we get in a car to go to the store, there's an associated risk with that. So I can't ever say there is no risk, but there's no risk. But I think in places like the hospital, we have the resources to mitigate that risk and to reduce a risk for patient. So I do believe that Sarasota Memorial and other institutions really do a great job of protecting their patients when they come in. And we recognize that by isolating those patients who are at greatest risk or are actively ill, restricting the staff members that care for those patients so that they aren't caring for one patient who has COVID and then going to another room where a patient does not, and providing the adequate resources for those nurses and physicians to maintain barriers, protective equipment, masks, gowns, booties, et cetera. All of those resources we've not had problems with providing. There, when this whole process really began, there was such a great concern for the availability of masks and the equipment that was necessary to care for these patients. And We've done a really good job of managing our resources appropriately. We've done a really good job of getting resources to us so that we've been able to have good supply chains for the equipment necessary. And we haven't really ever had any shortfalls in that equipment. And we've never really felt nervous to provide that kind of safety for both our staff and the patients who are coming in. It's often recommended that new parents have family and friends help out, especially when they first get home. Has Absolutely. that changed because of COVID-19? It has. I actually just had this conversation today with a patient. They are asking about, well, what should I do when I get home, and should I have my friends or family come over? And again, I come back to that statement of, there is no way to reduce your risk entirely. We know that women do need support uh, from partners and friends and family members, and we don't want to completely isolate them. But the first few weeks are definitely important for mother and baby to maintain a good relationship and have a good bond. Babies are at their greatest risk during those first few weeks of life from a standpoint of infection and exposure. And so I ask my patients to consider those kinds of factors. Think about where and who you're inviting into your home. If they have been traveling on the airplane and they flew in from New York in a hotspot, 
they're probably not the best people you want to bring to your home because of the risk of exposure. But if somebody's been quarantined and they've been, they're of low risk, they're asymptomatic, bringing some support people into your home is an acceptable risk with you maintaining some of those other things. Routine hand washing, making sure that if they do develop symptoms that they're not, that they don't come in, you know. Um, hygiene, just basic hygiene, and even maintaining still a little bit of that social distance to help reduce the risk of exposure. If a mother does have COVID-19 during their pregnancy, at any point during their pregnancy, how can it affect them? Well, it depends, again, on severity. The nice thing about pregnant women is that they typically are a little younger, um, and they uh, tend to be healthier. Uh, and we know that COVID's risks of hospitalization and um, severe outcomes is really associated with age, that as you get older, your risk of hospitalization and eating intervention and uh, morbidity and mortality go up. So pregnant women are kind of unique in the fact that because they're typically younger and a little bit healthier, they have fewer risks of progression to severe disease. So most women who are pregnant are mildly symptomatic. They may have the fever, the cough, the runny nose, the sore throat. The patients that we have cared for thus far that have had COVID, many of them actually have been asymptomatic. They have actually just been found with that routine universal screening. And so they're oftentimes surprised that they had infection. And so that's, a, again, a good thing for us because those patients are not critically ill and not needing to have um, you know, ICU support and those kinds of things. In general, we tell women that if they come in and they are diagnosed with COVID, manage their symptoms just like everybody else. As long as you are not having chest pain and shortness of breath, you're getting critically ill, your illness will probably be short-lived. You stay at home, you isolate. If you come to the hospital, please let us know. We will care for you and do exactly what we would do for every other patient. And then going home, again, some of these patients who have been asymptomatic but popped up positive with a COVID test, we tell them, look, you are at, you are asymptomatic. You could potentially be a vector to your baby or your family members, but practice that social distancing at home. Make sure that you're hand washing. Make sure that you are continuing to do the things necessary to prevent you or reduce the risk of you transferring that infection to other family members. With all of the mothers being tested before giving birth, have any mothers given birth at SMH who tested positive for COVID-19? And if so, what are the challenges faced during those deliveries? That's a great question. There have been several women we've cared for. Some have been ill and some, again, have been asymptomatic. Most of it centers around how to reduce the risk of the patient who is uh, affected passing it to the rest of the medical staff and protecting the newborn baby and her partner. The things that we're doing, again, are by universal screening, we're able to identify those patients who have it and putting them into isolating rooms where they have negative pressure. And we have other resources available to prevent the exposure risks to the rest of the staff members. The staff members, of course, are fully gowned and gloved. They wear masks. They wear the N95 respirators. And we offer that same stuff, uh, same equipment to the family members. Where it gets a little challenging is about the postpartum phase where what do we do with a mother who has a baby and wants to breastfeed and wants to bond with her baby because that's such an important time. And we really leave that up to the discussion between the patient and the physician, the obstetrician or other uh, specialists who are caring for her as well as the pediatrician who needs to be involved in that process. And it really is a discussion amongst all of us about how severe the mother's illness is, what's the likelihood of her passing it on to baby, and trying to balance that with the benefits of those first few hours, minutes, days of bonding mom and baby together. We want moms to breastfeed, and many of the patients who have tested positive for COVID were able to breastfeed. And I think that's really important for people to realize, for, for your listeners to know, because we, it's not like some, oh, no, you can't ever touch your baby and never be available. No, we, we want that to happen. And you just have to balance the risk of your health 
and what's going on with the likelihood of you transmitting it with the importance of taking care of that baby and giving them the best start to a new life. So the severity of the symptoms affects what you recommend to the mom? Absolutely. If a mother is critically ill and uh, she needs oxygen support or respiratory support, we're going to maybe not recommend she breastfeed because her it is more important for her to take care of herself and for allow us to take care of her and reduce the risk of her transmitting that virus to the baby. But these mothers who are minimally symptomatic or those that are asymptomatic and have no symptoms whatsoever, we recommend that they wear a face mask, that they practice strict hand hygiene, and that they change their clothes regularly and wash their clothes so that when they feed the baby, they are uh, reducing the risk of any of that virus getting over. But we have to recognize that breastfeeding is one of the best ways for babies to strengthen their immune system. There are antibodies in breast milk that help to protect the airway and protect the gastrointestinal tract from viruses. And so by allowing these mothers to breastfeed, we're actually ending up protecting the baby ultimately. But they're, they're not at risk of getting COVID-19 from the breast milk? So, no, to our understanding, the contamination occurs, again, from mouth, eyes, secretions in our face. We cough on somebody or breathe on somebody. We believe that that's the main way of transmission. Most of the studies show that COVID-19 is not transmitted in breast milk, so that is not itself the vector. But the mother's skin may be. So, again, by practicing strict hand hygiene and you know just good personal hygiene if she is able to minimize the chance of her breast being contaminated the top of the skin then she's going to not be able to transmit that to the baby same with hands same with kissing on the baby those kinds of things that's why we say wear the mask wear the glo- or not the gloves wear the mask wear the uh, wash the hands and protect yourself Is there a middle ground where you might recommend a mother pump instead of actually breastfeeding to protect the baby? Absolutely. You know, pumping, though, still is has the potential risk because you're still putting a device onto your skin and therefore that device is contaminated. So if a woman is going to pump and, and sometimes that is necessary for a variety of other reasons, it's not just necessarily to reduce the risk of COVID, that you the woman needs to make sure that she is practicing strict hygiene with the equipment, that it needs to be cleaned and sterilized after each feedings and making sure that she's reducing the chance of her equipment becoming contaminated. And then that for, therefore that becomes the vector that then passes the infection onto the baby. This has been an ever-changing pandemic. How has the, the changes in our knowledge of the virus and the disease, how has that changed your view and how has that changed your recommendations to mothers? That's a really great question. And, and if you ask me tomorrow that same one, it'll probably be a different answer. <laughs> uh, it really has evolved. I think from a standpoint at the very beginning of this, because there was such uncertainty about what this disease really meant, um, patients, our society, physicians were really, really scared of what this could represent. And as this has evolved, I think we have become a little more pragmatic about how we approach this disease. We've realized that it's not necessarily something to be as scared of as we once were in having, you know, fearful of high mortality rates and full ICUs and no treatments and those kinds of things. We now kind of recognize that this disease has an appropriate course the risks of morbidity or mortality were lower than originally projected. And I think the interventions that have happened that we've done as a collective society really have done a decent job of flattening the curve, that, uh, you know, that, that statement, and helping to protect the people who are at greatest risk for this. And that's taken the strain or the potential strain off of our healthcare system and has allowed us to kind of start to rebound into this world of dipping our our toes back into the waters of society. And I think that's a good thing overall. It's allowed us to kind of relax a little bit. We can swing the other way. We can go too far in that relaxed state and we go back to 
what we used to consider as normal. And that might be a little too soon to do that quite yet. We need to be smart, we need to be pragmatic, we need to recognize that it's still out there in the communities and there are still people who are at risk for catching this disease and having bad outcomes. But if we, if we practice smart social interaction, we'll continue to manage this. We will continue to develop treatments and using medications like remdesivir and other supportive measures, we, we are learning more about how to do that and do it well, and that protects our patients and reduces their risk of morbidity and mortality. And that buys us more and more time to get towards a vaccine and a more universal way of managing this disease. And I guess I'll have to ask you that question again in a couple of weeks That's exactly in the future. Right. All right, Dr. Kyle Garner, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. And thank you, everyone, who has joined us for this important episode of HealthCast. For more information about COVID-19 at Sarasota Memorial Hospital, visit smh.com slash COVID-19 to get the latest news. We, of course, encourage you all to stay informed, stay safe, and stay healthy. Thank you for joining us today. For more information, please visit smh.com. Follow us on your favorite social media network.